Hi, I'm John Tadekis, and you're one to one with me. And I'm one to one with Zane Virgie. There she is, former CNN State Department correspondent. Um, she's made a successful transition into the world of communications and creative entrepreneurship. Um, her, her communications firm is Zane Virgie Group, and she's worked with a deep lineup of organizations on their communications and public relations strategies via advisory, consulting, and content production. Um, so she's quite, she's a very smart person, a quite <laughs> dynamic person. And Zane, welcome. It's great to see you and talk with you again. It's great to see you. It's been so many years and it's just a treat and a privilege to get this time with you. And uh, I've missed you. Well, I miss you. In fact, you actually came and spoke to one of my classes that I taught at American University. And so these were these were interns. They were journalism students who were interning at various news organizations in right. D.C. And so you came and talked to them about your career. And so just to get started, my question to you is how how is your life? How did your life? How did your life change? from what you expected it would be to what it is uh, to the what train wreck that it currently is right. <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> <say that. laughs> um gosh uh okay you know unvarnished here it it changed in ways i could never have imagined i thought that i would make a relatively easy transition from leaving cnn as a state department correspondent and and ultimately as an anchor where i was based in london the last few years at cnn and i thought i'm zane i know all these people um, i will be able to transition relatively smoothly into an, an a space i wanted to invest and develop in which was focusing on content in africa right, and really empowering young local content creators uh, with the tools, with the money, uh, with, with training to be able to produce and develop greater and better stories. And I, you know, I, I got a big kick in the gut because it was really hard. Re like, I, I think, John, if I had known what I would have had to go through to even get to this place today, I'm not sure I would have done it. Because being an entrepreneur is, it's actually punishing. When you see successful entrepreneurs, you don't see all this other stuff that's gone on behind the scenes and what they've had to endure, multiple failures, you know, loss of money, no income, personal drama, you know, making ends meet, lawsuits, relationships, family, like it can oh be, it's chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that because I'm me, I could speed dial someone, at least one person, and they could back me in my idea. And guess what happened? No one stepped up, no, no one, right? And so I took the risk, which in retrospect was probably a bad idea, and I fully self-funded my own venture with a co-founder that I partnered with, uh, also former CNN and Turner and uh, head of product. And um, we, we built a company called Acoma, which was focused on Africa and developing storytelling on, on the continent, which is 54 countries. So that's a big problem that we had to solve right there uh, with a market that we, we knew existed, but a business model that was untested and which we pursued. So you know that you know after being on the Situation Room and all the producers and, and you and, and copy editing and Wolf and, and everybody is there to support you to be successful. So now here I'm in a scenario where there's there's no investment cash, no backup, and just me and my business partner, Chitty. And I had to learn and do everything, understand how business models work, not to be nervous in a room when I'm asking for money, even just like asking for money, you know, that was hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so it was extremely hard. It continues to be hard. Um, I just have learned to adjust better. And I am happy in what I do. I have to admit, though, it's still a struggle. Well, now you didn't, I mean, you didn't even start out go, to go into journalism when you were a kid, right? No, I always wanted to like work for the UN or something, maybe something in environment and gender, which is what, what the track I was on uh, was, was to take me to. Uh, and then I just fell into it. I fell into it after volunteer uh, volunteering on a radio station in Kenya, in Nairobi, the capital. 
Um, and they needed somebody to read the traffic and travel news updates. And my dad was like, cool, cool, this friend of mine who's, you know, doing something at this radio station. Don't just sleep all day, at, you know, this summer. <laughs> And so I did, and and I and I had little walkie talkies, and I was like Charlie Zero, uh, Charlie One, this is Charlie Zero, come in. What's the traffic like? And then I would go on air, and I'd read the traffic. Then I ended up doing the love show at night called Love Lines, and I became a radio DJ. And I learned that I could just talk a lot, on and on and on, and I seemed to be quite clear in front of a microphone as well. And I realized. I, remember, that, I think I remember you telling the class. I think I remember you telling the class. <laughs> <laughs> that the, uh, the 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 traffic that you were doing right. was really yeah. boring because yeah. it was like, well, it's busy. It's <laughs> it's busy and moving. It's <laughs> moving and 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 this is not busy. This is busy but moving. This is busy and moving. Yeah, yeah. Good memory. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then and then I evolved after the embassy bombings uh, in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam because the radio station was downtown and over overlooking the U.S. embassy. So on, uh, was it August 7th at like 10.30 in the morning, there was this boom and the building shook. I was in a building on the 19th floor of Lonro House in Nairobi. And that actually triggered a move into hard news uh, because then the BBC had want, wanted local uh, stringers to put together s stories and, and do some reporting. And then I transitioned to the local TV network after that as well. And how long were you with CNN? 14 years. <laughs> I started at 25. Oh, man. Yeah, and I left when I was 40. So. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Well, you know. you, you're well <laughs> preserved. <laughs> Like a fine wine. Yeah, Thanks. right. Exactly. So, um, who? So, were you State Department correspondent right off the bat, or how did this evolve? So, when I came to Atlanta first as an anchor for CNN International, I had quite literally very limited experience on breaking news, live interviews, right? And CNN took a big chance on me and said, basically, we think you have talent, but you have no experience and you don't have a clue how a newsroom actually works. So we'll train you. You can learn to be a producer and a writer. And then on, on the occasional weekend, you can anchor. And if you do well, we'll promote you. And if you mess up, we'll send you back to Kenya after three years and you can just mm. write. <laughs> so, um, and so I was like, okay. But again, everybody worked together on air to, to make me successful like i remember a northern ireland story and there was breaking news and that's not like an easy thing to wrap your head around all you know all the different parties and the politics and people would be in my ear ask telling me what question to ask to relax to okay you know say this smile to smile <laughs> right and so i had a crutch like those early days um there was a lot of uh, support and even one of my anchor friends that you'll know him michael holmes um, and, and they all ha they were like, listen, don't worry about breaking news, right? Here's a sheet. And if anything happens, any of these questions will work, right? So if, <laughs> if there's an earthquake, Evergreen. Crash, Evergreen like, question. Like, yeah. just, just be like, what happened? <laughs> Are there any eyewitness accounts? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, Why? Oh, that's yeah, a wonderful yeah, question. Yeah, exactly, right? So, so I had my training wheels in Atlanta. Six years later, I, I moved to Washington to you and to Wolf and the team after having run into Wolf um, at uh, Hartsfield Airport. And he had said, why don't you join me? And I said, okay. So it was really a special moment that triggered a lot of really great stuff. And so you were State Department correspondent and was it Condoleezza Rice who was yeah. the Secretary of State? What yeah. was that like? In retrospect, it was probably the best three years of my career. <laughs> And I just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> when I look back on it, I, I thought to myself, I should have appreciated this more, right? Like, why didn't I realize the privilege uh, and, and the rarity of what I was doing and what I had access to? Why um, didn't you? Why didn't you recognize? Was it just too nerve wracking? I think we were just busy, right? Like we were just on this. Okay, you're, you, you know, you're flying here with the secretary. This is this is the schedule. You know, what are you filing for sit room tonight? And it was just we, you were in it with limited perspective. So the learning curve was really steep for me, 
as a beach reporter, which I had never been, uh, for CNN Domestic, uh, and you know, with the main political show coming out of Washington. And so it was uh, a, a very big ex and exciting learning curve, but um, it, it, the reason I couldn't see it as clearly as I do now is because I didn't have distance and uh, maybe I was younger and didn't appreciate all these amazing things coming to me quite, quite easily, but with a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I would say that's why. And it was just, it was just fun. Right? Like it was, Are there things that you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Yes, uh, there are. Um, I, I had spent three years covering Condoleezza Rice, and I thought three years of covering foreign policy was quite a long time. And I was I was so sure of it, and I and I and I wanted to uh, do more uh, different kinds of reporting and 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 more anchoring, perhaps in a different city. But what what I didn't realize is that I actually should have stayed or want or, or expressed my desire to stay longer at the State Department because then I would have really understood um, over say a decade even the evolution of foreign policy under many secretaries of state, not just one. And so I think um, I, didn't, I didn't acquire ultimately the kind of depth in a beat report reporting status that I, that I um, think I would have liked under my belt. Um, yeah. Now that you've got the perspective that you do, and now that you're not in the CNN maelstrom anymore, um, obviously CNN is a lot different from when you and I were there. How, in what way, from your perspective, is CNN different? Well, um, I think I think that I think CNN is different for me in the sense that there seems to be a, a shift in any interest in international news. Uh, at least on Sit Room, we were doing a global story a day, right? Uh, we th there was there was interest in in the Middle East or Asia or Africa or if a, a good character, or a good story, something 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 poignant that's happened. Um, the the producing teams uh, and the leaders of the network were interested in that, interested in the world. So I think a big shift is is that that's changed, and there's just more domestic interest um, and an overly uh, hungry Trump appetite. Uh, I do think CNN, you know, bears responsibility uh, for uh, you know uh, for the for the election of Trump. Because Why do you say that? Because of the amount of airtime, right? Um, I do think that there. I, I mean, I I wouldn't say it was the only factor because there were clearly multiple factors at play. Uh, but I was disappointed to see that much airtime, and even now, uh, to uh, to, to only Trump at the time of the election. So I, I, I think that um, the, uh, the, the, the the coverage of the White House and the president is is important, obviously, but it's been at the cost of global news that is relevant. Um, I also think, you know, on some on many shows, not all the the, the shift toward opinion, I don't really like. Right. So it's uh, you know. Uh, it, it's become it's become less of a neutral uh, or, or I know there's nothing as objectivity, but there's a, there seems a, a carte blanche for certain anchors on prime time to just say what, whatever they want with no holds barred, and that's encouraged. So I, I don't I don't really like that. Why uh, not? Um, because because I, I, it, it it's taken uh, the hue of an unhelpful opinion. There's helpful help and there's unhelpful help. And I just think it's become more part of the noise than the signal, right? So if you have an opinion, like I'm listening to Farid or someone and there's a perspective that's sort of quite thoughtful, then I appreciate that. And I understand I'm coming to a, a show that, that is offering in this segment a, a commentary, right? Mm -hmm. Or framing the show in a commentary. Uh, but I don't appreciate just like, eye rolls and sighing and overt opinion and just like gas, you know, just hyperventilation. Oh my God, what an idiot. Right. Or, you yeah. know, I, I, I actually think that adds to the noise. I get that on social media. Um, I get that in many places. I get that at, over dinner, so, you know, um, but I don't, I don't want to get that when I turn on CNN. And, and I think there's a little bit of a loss of, um, of, uh, you know, caliber in my view.
Yeah. So yeah. let's but transition. Not in the situation room. The situation room is still uh, the situation. Room. The gang of Wolf? you know on point. You yes. Know? <laughs> Wolf. Wolf was probably the last oh. of the old school. You know, yeah. just the facts, ma'am. Journalists. I mean, exactly. I worked with him for seven years, and I have no idea what his politics are. And I'm, I, I would imagine that that's pretty much your experience as well. Yes, I, I do not know Wolf's politics. It's just straight down the middle. Um, people mm -hmm. ask all the time, what was this anchor like? Or what was this one like, or Anderson or Christian or, you know, all of these things. But when it, whenever I'm asked about Wolf, what sometimes what I think about and what I say is that there's just, you know, never been such a classy gentleman uh, in news media that I ever met than Wolf. And so mm -hmm. I, I hold him uh, in quite high regard. Uh, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Same here. And I and it's been pretty much universal in my experience with the people who's who have worked closely with him. Yeah. Um, so he's he's quite the champion of his staff. Well, um, we're the wolf pack. Yes. We're, we're members of the wolf pack. He still hasn't <laughs> sent us the t shirts though. I'm so it's been years we've been waiting. He keeps saying that, but I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> Oh, well, um, let's move on to this whole entrepreneur thing. Um, and, and in fact, I, you gave a TED talk once. And why don't you, because the TED talk really describes this transition to entrepreneurship. So uh, summarize, what, first, what was it like to do a TED talk? How did that come about? Was it nerve wracking? What's the experience? I was so nervous, John. Like I was like, I thought to myself, I've been speaking all my life uh, publicly right. I'm, and I'm dying of nerves on this red dot. And it felt like an enormous amount of pressure. They really get in uh, the, into the script and the in, evolution of the script and the, the way you deliver and, and what story you're going to tell. And I was quite impressed at the, the hands-on element of it, but I was sweating bullets basically, um, but I was happy to have a platform to get the message out about what uh, what my experience has been, so so it's um, yeah. How it long was, did it take? How long did it take to uh, develop the the message and to you know to get it from you know the idea all the way through the the um, molding of it to actually the delivery of it? It was about six months. Oh my! Yeah, I know. I know. I thought I would just come in and you know I'm yeah. I wing it a bit, right? And maybe a bit of prompter up somewhere, or uh, and uh, but no. I mean, you you had a little slide thing you could use, um, and maybe one and one or two keywords, right, to to catch your eye on the monitor at the bottom. But it's just you know it's quite intimidating. The red dot, the spotlight, you know, the dark auditorium, and I just you just see light. So uh, and and you don't want to stumble. And so everybody who did well memorized a 20 minute talk. I did have a little cheat sheet though. I did use the little offering that they gave me of we can put some bullet points down here. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that really captured the entrepreneurial journey quite well. Did the message change significantly from inception to delivery? Uh, the message did evolve to be finer and use actual experiences to demonstrate the point that I was making, right? So it wasn't enough to say Africans need to own their own narrative, right? Then I really had to dig and go, okay, well, what what, what do I have in my wheelhouse personally, uh, conversations or experiences that I've had with others, uh, my own observations? How, how do I bring all of that into a way that, that flows well, uh, is compelling, and has uh, some color uh, at, and, and meat on the bones. So the message was refined. I think that's what I would say. So, and so exactly what is the message? The TED talk was, had the, the core message was the storyteller is the most important person in Africa. And I went on to explain why. It's because it's the storyteller that sets the values uh, and the, um, the agenda of a generation. Uh, it's the storyteller that understands how to authentically tell their own local stories, right? And it's the storyteller that has the ability to uh, project their nation or their region or their continent soft power. 
And all of these elements are critical when it comes to storytelling on the continent. And it's more complex because you have 54 countries, 54 cultures, more than 54 languages, and you don't have um, a, a market like, say, in the US, right? There's, there's a media market. Right, um, you know, NB NBC has affiliates. There's, you know, the main NBC, and the business is structured around that. The content and distribution is clear, right? Um, with and with providers as well, like Comcast, AT and T, Spectrum. Like we all understand how it works. In Africa, it's very fragmented, and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't exist like that, right? It, you you can't just say I'll national I'll broadcast continent wide and then build a successful business model around it so <clears throat> the how do you solve the problem of monetizing a fragmented mo media market in Africa and you know how how do you use technology to do that and so I explained in that talk what I had learned and what I had done and all the big fat jolly mistakes uh, that that Chidi that's my business partner and co-founder and I had made and we applied many things that were successful in the US to Africa. They failed. And, um, you know, for example, using branded content as a, as a business model, um, using storytelling instead of just an ad or, you know, no pop ups and banners on our site. So um, uh, I also built, a, uh, I learned how to build a product, a digital product and a platform. And so the message there was, we, we had the right problem that we wanted to solve, but the way that we did it with the platform and with the business model was wrong. And what did work, then I explained, which was, you know, um, which was the ability to connect, to be content connectors, right? Not content creators, no money, very difficult, fragmented market. But when we were able to connect buyers and sellers and producers and buyers of content, that, that was a, a really interesting opportunity. And when, when we were able to teach and uh, bring in um, a, uh, a cohort for two years across the continent, or well, four countries, and we were able to bring quality training uh, to storytelling, that was successful. There was a big, big appetite for that. So give me an example in sort of microcosm what it is that you do in terms of connecting uh, a, a communicator or a storyteller in Africa with uh, the U.S. What in, in a microcosm? How does that work? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you one example uh, of of when we were building a coma, how that worked. Right. So through Amplify, the talent accelerator, that was the tr the, the, the training, the content um, creator uh, learning platform. Uh, through that, we identified a whole bunch of really amazing creators in Kenya, Rwanda, Ghana, and Nigeria, right? So there were maybe about 30 people in this particular cohort one year, and they were all in their cities and towns, uh, mostly the capitals actually, and they were able to produce local content around them in their local language and sort of st some street languages that exist in Africa as well that are kind of colloquial um, and not the formal language. Um, and so we have them on, on one side here, right? Then I get a phone call from, for example, MasterCard saying, we really want to run a campaign in Nigeria, but we don't want to hire a production company in the US or the UK. They don't really understand pigeon. You know, the Nigerians kind of street talk is pigeon English. So it's like a bastardized version of English and Nigerian and funny um, and, you know, difficult to follow many times. For me, <laughs> not for my co-founder. Uh, so, so, so I was able to say, "Oh, wait a minute, Mastercard! I got this whole gang of Nigerians, right? And they're so freaking creative and amazing. Um, and so, I will connect you to these creators, and you build your uh, local campaign with pigeon and local ideas and visuals and." Um, uh, and 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 talk about I think it was a product they had called Master Pass. So it was like a digital wallet that they wanted to promote. And so rather than finding external people who have no clue about the country, um, I was able to connect a global brand interested in entering or and growing, not just entering the African audiences 
in markets, right? The 54 markets, Nigeria is after South Africa or before South Africa is the biggest one. Um, and so if you crack Nigeria, you can kind of crack most places. So that's, that's one microcosm example. Um, I have to tell you though that Acoma, that company failed ultimately, and I had to shut it down uh, about a year and a half ago. So that was rough, actually. Mm. I, that, that was a big kick in the head. I, 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 I do view the failure as a good notch under my belt because I've learned so much. And so now to answer uh, one last thing that you wanted me to, uh, so now I, I, I do some of that work but I'm not so ensconced in the, the content production side of things because the content production side of things in Africa doesn't make money and there's no, uh, yet, <laughs> there's no money uh, in Western markets anymore for it, right? So, I mean, imagine like now I go to CNN and go, hey, I've got some great content from Africa. Like they don't care. They have their own operation and why would they buy mine? And if they did buy it, which one organization did, it wasn't much money. So I don't really immerse myself so much on the content side, production. Is it necessary though to be so African centric? Is it something that is, is, is it possible for you to do what you do and in a sense broaden uh, your, your approach? Yes, uh, I can absolutely, because the models that we built, especially for Amplifiers Content Creator, Creator Accelerator, for the fellowship program, um, it could be applied anywhere, right? Like we did Amplify New York one, one instance when, I, when uh, we had a project at, a play, at, at uh, Africa House during UNGA. We could do it in Asia, we could do it in Latin America. It's just a model that can be transposed quite easily. My interest in Africa is I'm passionate about it. Um, I understand it well, right? Um, and I have a competitive advantage in Africa because I know where to go, I know who to call, I know how things are done. Uh, whereas in other parts of the world, you know, I would be, you know, while, while I could compete, I wouldn't be, uh, I, would, I wouldn't have the kind of muscle that I do, that I think I do, <laughs> well, that I thought I had, right. uh, you know. Uh, on the so, the, so you've transitioned to the Zane Virgie group, correct? Yes. And tell, tell what's that exactly? So that's me trying to dig myself out of a big financial hole. <laughs> so, but other than that, um, it, it's essentially global media advisory work for emerging markets, whether they're countries, corporations, foundations, individuals. So you know, and it's still quite got a quite a heavy Africa angle to it, right? So sure. so I I work with organizations and I advise them you know, do it like this, do it like that. I have a good, as you know, Rolodex of, of people that I know around the world uh, and just pitching people to be covered, right? So I, I might pitch a story to the New York Times or to the Wall Street Journal, because, you know, we have friends there. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And, or really try and advise on, here's how you shape the story, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's really, this Zoom webinar is really not interesting. Um, you know, perhaps we should create an event I got into the events business a lot pre, you know, COVID. And then that, you know, that got a big bullet to its head. I had a big yeah. events year. I had a bumper events year, John, uh, in January. I was so proud of myself. I was like, yeah, finally, you know, money, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And it's something stable, right? It's been six years of not having that. Um, so, so that was tough. So how do you, I mean, especially with all these challenges and setbacks, how do you philosophically or spiritually or mentally approach this and overcome it? What's the secret or how have you dealt that's, with it? That's so, that's, that's so great that you ask that and close to my heart. Um, I, I really had a tough time, you know, I, I just, I struggled badly. And then my, my business partner, co-founder Chidi, uh, who's a close friend also now, uh, uh, partner in crime, uh, got me into stoicism and stoic philosophy. And mm -hmm. I read uh, The Obstacle is the Way, and I read um, Stillness is the Key. Where is it? Somewhere here. And then every day I read The Daily Stoic, right? And it really helps me. And I understand that I organize the world into what I can control, what I can't control. If I'm upset, I just wait before reacting. 
I ask myself, is this really necessary when, you know, when I, when, when, when I have a packed day or I'm in an argument or I'm, I'm annoyed or I want to do this or that? I wonder to myself, you know, it's not about getting lots of clients. I just want to work with one or two I respect and that respect me and that are good and where I can grow. So I, I, I've learned how to organize the world into what can be controlled and what can't. And I've learned to manage my own philosoph myself with a very disciplined philosophy. And I don't get let myself get rattled. Like I use I you know, you know how you know how anchors and correspondents are, right? <laughs> oh, the, 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 diva, and, the diva. Ah, the diva. Yeah. The diva, right? Well, you were never like, like that. that. Yeah. But, okay, not not as bad as some we know that shan't be named. Um <laughs> But, but you know, I, I did I have a good sense of my own self and I, I, I'm, you know, quite specific. I want things like this and that. And and so I've had to learn, you know, to slow down. I've, I've had to learn to accept things as they well, are. Not here's my question. I, I mean, I, I don't know much about stoicism. I mean, the only thing I know is that it's basically, you know, uh, uh, be <laughs> impassive, I guess. And, I'm, I, and that's probably not even close to what it is. So what's the essence of stoicism? For me, it's understanding that you can control only certain number of things in a day or in a month or in life, and identifying what you cannot control is really important. So I cannot control how somebody reacts to something I propose or say. Uh, I can't control it if somebody has cancer I can't, and I'm upset. I can't control it if... Uh, you know, if, if, if anything extreme happens, but I can control how I behave and I, I can parse out to myself now quite well, although I have my moments, you know, uh, ways of, of processing situations. Uh, so for example, like let, let's look at president Trump and the whole election campaign. And, you know, we were, we're all like watching the news, but I've stoicism. One part of it is learning how to be still. And you can't be still if you're constantly, you know, got notifications and you're on Telegram and Confide and WhatsApp and text and email and I, you can't do it. So I practically discipline my day that I am, I, my notifications are off. I'm not checking social media. I'm not watching TV except maybe, you know, I mean, I don't even watch TV. That actually, it's for Netflix, but I'm not, I'm not putting so much crap in my head that I yeah. can't do deep work and I can't think. So the essence for me is accepting what I can, can control and what I can't and learning how to just, just pause and be still and preparing myself very well for the worst. What's the worst? I'll die. Someone I love dies. That's the worst, right? Yeah. Some oh, fatal, yeah. Then, then there's lesser worsts, right? Okay, so the worst thing is my company fails, but you know, I'll still have food and shelter. Okay. And then, and then I'll meet a horrible, then I'll prepare myself for the day. I'm going to meet just some really awful people. I'm going to meet some idiots. I'm going to meet some great people. I'll meet some arrogant people. And so by the time I meet them, I'm already prepared. Like it's not a surprise to me. And, and so I'm, I control my behavior better with, with a bit more discipline. So wow. I think, yeah, so that's what being an entrepreneur has taught me, um, that, that I, if I can't manage myself because it's so hard, like 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 so hard, as you can appreciate too, sure. um, you know, it's it, it, it's um, then I then I, I I would have gone, you know, I would have had some kind of a breakdown, which you know right. I might have, um, sure. and uh, and this has really helped me. So if anyone is struggling, I recommend the obstacle is the way. Now, is writing also therapeutic in your life? <laughs> Yes. Uh, Is that a we yes? Have, we have a lot to discuss here now. Okay. And actually, it's it's when I we started talking again, I haven't written in a couple of years because of all this drama on the entrepreneurial side. I just was like, I, I just I don't have any creative thing left in me. Yeah, I'm just I'm just like trying to like mop the blood off the floor, you know, all day. Um, so so I I had started writing many years ago and stopped. Uh, and and now I'm restarting. Honestly, John, maybe like two weeks ago, I picked up some old, 
when we were talking and you said, take my course. And, you know, I did a whole degree in creative writing, right? Did I tell well, you? Really? I, no, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, I, when I was C at CNN in London, I applied to Oxford and they had a two year creative writing degree. And so it was a part time thing. So I was anchoring in the morning and then at Oxford in the afternoon and then you know, writing poetry in the evening and then anchoring whatever breaking news was going on. <laughs> so I, I feel very happy when I write and the pandemic has allowed me to go, wait a minute, I'm not doing the one thing that excites me. So, so the writing that you do, is it poetry, journaling? Are you writing a short story or a novel? What what are you writing? Okay, so I need your help now. I'm glad you asked this question. <laughs> now now I'm going to ask you what, oh, I'm, what I should do, right? Go back to Oxford. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I think now I've studied enough. I need to deliver something. Oh, okay. Um, so, so I have the following, okay? I have a second draft of a detective novel done. Excellent. That novel is problematic because two leading characters conflict too much and you can't tell who's the lead. And it's a, detec mm -hmm. it's a detective novel set in Kenya and it's my favorite genre, m crime, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, number two, I have written a, uh, a children's book series about a, a young girl's magical adventures in journalism. And that is what I chose to start with. Is this based on you? It's a little based on what me and what I've learned. Yes, yeah. so it's okay, it's good. more like more what I've learned in, in it's a way to teach journalism, right? So you're learning, yes. right? But then you've got this character, right? Yep. So yep. some magic happens to her, and yep. she yep. turns into a journalist, and her dog becomes a producer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a lot of dogs that are producers. <laughs> You know, I was thinking that I might get in trouble for that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so there's that. And there's, there's you know, the, the first series is called, um, you know, she's on safari. And then the next one, she's on a diplomatic mission. And she ends up in North Korea, right? So to, but yeah. Zane, you're not describing any problems at all. These are great. Okay. What's the what's okay. the problem? So, uh, and then, and then, and then, okay. And then there are a couple of other things. Like I wrote a play. Uh, two, a two-headed play that's just sitting there and I don't know what to do with it. Uh, it's like 20 minutes only. And then I wrote a sitcom uh, called, uh, what was it called? Oh, geez, I forgot what it was called. Um, uh, it's so memorable. It's yeah. called Airbrush. Airbrush. Oh, and that's it's, a good and it's, yeah. and it's it's about uh, a newsroom and the primetime shows fighting each other but told from the perspective of a makeup artist. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. All the stuff, and I've got a little journalism handbook. So the problem is, because there's always a problem, is that <laughs> the novel, the 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 plot does is not has having a problem. If I if I take away the conflicting character, then I have a well, the whole plot falls because sure. everything right. But yep. the but the magical journalism piece, the problem here, is that. Um, <laughs> is that I don't know how magical to get and do, do I do I create like monsters and myths and good ones and bad ones mm -hmm. why is this magic happening to this African girl uh, I, I don't I don't know yet what what's like you know Harry Potter right we know why mm -hmm. he the magic happened to him and we know that there was a portal on what was the platform five and a half ten and a half that half so there oh, was a right. What was it again? It was the platform. It was the, yeah. It was uh, the off, right? Right. So that's the portal into the magic, and so I am spending my mornings at five a.m., which is when I write for twenty minutes now. Um, I, I on sort of researching folklore and and mythology and creatures, and and I'm wondering, do I go into like that universe, or do I just keep it as humans? And she just has some magic happen, but you know there are humans everywhere and animals in this particular one. So I don't know what to do, and I don't. Well, know I mean, but you, you've done a lot. You've got a lot of creativity um, in yeah. a lot of different genres and venues. Um, I mean, what you're describing is the vexation of the creative process. Right. That's a, that is a given, and so, it's a bunch of decisions that are made. But then nothing is etched in stone you get to you know it's the steaming pile of clay and then you remold it you know so how you know. Have you, i mean you've become this amazing novelist right 
like I've, I've written a few novels. Okay, I've, but you know, I appreciate how hard it is to even a get one word down, have it all make sense, finish it, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it. Mm -hmm. Right, like that's hard, and you've done a few. So how, I know I'm not supposed to ask you anything here, but if I may, if you'll allow me, um, yes, ma'am. Like, like what, I, what would be your advice based on what you've learned as to how to navigate the struggle? So that the plot's down, but the the, the actual um, unique uh, aspect, the decisions you talk about. How do you navigate the struggle of a, the writer? Well, I think one of the ways you navigate it is through the stoicism that you've talked about, because there's only so much you can control. I think, though, what you're describing is uh, an, a world where you have total control. And that's what a writer, and so that's what makes it so vexing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, the and, and I don't know if you experience writer's block, but writer's mm -hmm. block can be very paralyzing. And at its root is fear, mm -hmm. you know, the fear of not getting it right or the fear of making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way to burst through that is to recognize that, yeah, you're going to make mistakes. It's not going to be perfect. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you right. go forward and then and, and you do that with your sort of right brain creativity. And then you turn your left brain on and look at it critically to see if it works. Right, And so it's a matter of shuttling back and forth between right brain and left brain without getting paralyzed by doubt, because that's really where I think people get tripped up the most is the, the feeling that it's not going to be perfect. It's not. And it's, it's, it's not. But how, how do you write? Do you know exactly where you're going at the end point of each chapter or the entire story you've already mapped out in advance, which is what I did with a detective novel. I had this crazy wall of chapters, like I knew where I was going. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm kind of writing it kind of as I'm thinking it. Well, so what should I um, do? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, I don't, I don't want to give you shoulds and oughts because what you're describing is a very valid creative approach. Uh, one thing I've discovered that's very helpful is procrastination it works <laughs> because if you're thinking of if you're thinking about your novel and ruminating that's writing you know a lot of times people think oh i've got to write a thousand words right. a day or i'm not right. a writer no you, you know if you're thinking about it that's fine right, right. um and so pr procrastination really gets me through a lot of a lot of those problems because when it finally comes time to write i've thought it through right. and what you've what you're doing is seat of the pantsing and that's really good because you are allowing for the serendipity but i think that you know there's a i think a balance the ideal is to have the balance between planning it out and having an idea where you're going to go with it, right. and then allowing for the serendipity as well. So the goal, I think, creatively, is to right. have planning and seat of the pants in right. together. Okay. okay. So that when Very so good. that when you're paralyzed in one area, you can go back and and try the other. And do you write till the end, right? Even if it's not perfect, and then and then go back and rewrite, or do you try mm -hmm. and refine a chapter at a time and then? Um, the, the best advice I ever got was from Robert Ray, who wrote the book, The Weekend Novelist. Right. And his advice, and I've used this for all five of my novels, is to write it straight through and turn off your internal editor. Right. And I, che I cheat just a little bit because what I also do, because I'm a congenital editor, is yeah. I'll, 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 I know where I'm, I know where I'm going, but I, I'll, I'll, stick, I'll sit with a chapter for a, a day or two, you know, and I'll do the proofreading and I'll copy edit a little bit, but right. I'll rough it in so that it's acceptable and then I'll move on. The goal is to have the forward yeah. momentum right. because the, the danger is most writers, I don't know if most do it, but a lot of writers loop back. They keep looping back to the first chapter and right. they, and it blunts their forward momentum. Right. And so um, um, maintaining that forward momentum is so important because right. you get to the end and it's done. It right. sucks, but it's right. done. Right. And then you go back and make it better. Right. And right. as you say, you do that a couple of times. You revise beta readers, you know, friends who will look at it and tell you what's not working. Right. That's that's so important.
Okay, I'm going to send you. You're going to be one of my friends who tells me what's. I am. Not I'm already working. one of your friends. <laughs> who tells me what's not working? <laughs> yeah. Listen, you know, I know you only had a limited amount of time to be with me today, but we could go on and on. I. Uh, oh wow! It's uh, already. Is, yeah. Well, also, I can. I can. Stay for a few more minutes if if there was Good. something critical, maybe like five well, minutes. here's here's my here's my question, and that is f for those people who are struggling, uh, you know, especially an entrepreneur type person where you're really your own boss, but to a certain extent, you know that still depends on other people yeah. and other things coming together. What's your advice? What what's probably the big takeaway that you've learned over your life and over this struggle, you know, to become more of an entrepreneur? Um, that you should have a lot of alcohol handy. <laughs> <laughs> Booze. The harder it is, the better. You know. Um, yeah, I I I um I think I think I would say that that I've taken away that it's okay to fail because 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 even if things are a struggle it doesn't mean it's the end right and i was so used to achieving things that when things were not working out i thought oh my god this is what's happening right and i've come to realize that that's actually not failure that's growth and that to be daring and to take risks is what this is entrepreneurial uh, life is all about and to, to act is also important because many people want to be entrepreneurs and they have these ideas and that, you know, but, but don't actually do something or, you, you know, you have an idea and you, you have to take a first step, right? You have, you have to dream it, but you also have to practically plan it and ultimately execute it. What I've also learned is, is the ability to pivot, right? So, oh, that didn't work, well, let's try this. Well, that didn't work and let's try that. And so never to actually be stuck to one idea and believe that I'm right. And I'm, I'm always stress testing my idea based on what, what, you know, what I'm hearing about the space I'm in, but I mean, willing flexibility. To, flexibility yeah, sounds always, like yeah, yeah, always, a, always adjusting um, and, and uh, testing the product, testing the idea. And so I just, I'm just excited that I've done this, John. Uh, even though I've I've uh, said it was really really tough, but having a vision and having a dream, or having ha having the inspiration to get somewhere, is hard hard work. And if you're willing to do the work, and if you're willing to treat it like a marathon, you have to apply that vision with action. Um, so that's that's what I would do, even if it's a small step. Yeah, I read this book called The Five A.M. Club, and it really helped me because it was like because it said you know do even if you make one percent progress that day just write it down what what percent what what do you want to make one percent progress on 365 days with a one percent progress you can make a pretty big stride right exactly. so or or you know a page a day write a page a day right and by the end of the year you'll have a lot there of pages go. there you go so that's that's what i would say um, okay. Yeah. Um, if people want to contact you, zanevergiegroup.com, you'd have a, yes. they can contact you that way? They can. Uh, Zane at zanevergiegroup.com. Because ah, well, that's your, that would be your, well, I can I write that down. You Hold just on. see my name multiple times everywhere. So it's zane at zanevergiegroup.com. <laughs> zane, zane, I'm writing this down now. Zanevergiegroup. Dot com. You can yeah. proofread it for me now. Hold on. I'll proofread it. And there. Zane at zanevergiegroup.com. Always an amazing editor. There you go. <laughs> there it well, it's, it's, let's face it, it's a low budget operation. Right? <laughs> yeah, lots of things have become low budget here. Um, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to just tell you one thing too is that a big game changer for me has been running. Right. Like I never ran ever in my life. And the pandemic started. I couldn't go to the gym, which has helped me with mental health. You know, just exercizing, changing brain chemical when I'm struck when I was well, struck. Aren't, aren't the Kenyans the fastest no. people in the world? <laughs> Not this Kenyan. Not oh. this Kenyan. This Kenyan never has never run a day in her life. Uh, <laughs> 
before March 2020. And I've only oh. ever really run if, I, if I've been chased, to be honest, by like <laughs> an animal or a person. So oh, I, I, I've come to appreciate the meditative nature of running. And when you talked about you're actually, when you're thinking about the plot, you're, you know, you're also working it out when you're not necessarily in front of a computer or typing or writing notes. So I actually find that ideas then come to me and I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll make that man half human, half hyena. Um, uh, you know, that's what the thought I had today. I was like, yeah, maybe I need a, you know, I need one of those like those mythological creatures in, in, in this. And then, um, and then I was, I was looking at river gods and, you know, the meanings of different animals. And so it was actually intellectually stimulating. And I thought, and I got, just got that while I was running. So it gives me peace. It gives me strength. It gives me a little bit of euphoria and it doesn't cost anything. Wow. And it's not alcoholic either. And it, <laughs> This has yeah, been wonderful. Not alcoholic either, because I go <laughs> too early for me to start. You know, I even exactly. have my little running watch here, um, <laughs> so I'm take I'm taking it seriously. Um, okay. But anyway, Excellent. so I just wanted well, to share that with you. Thank you. This has been a treat. I hope we get a chance to do this again sometime. Well, so um, what are we doing about the writing? Are you going to help me with my stuff, or do I have to sure? Sign we'll up? talk. We'll we'll talk after we get offline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All okay. Right. Thanks, Zane. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Bye.